Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Welcome to Forest Hills Church. We are doing our online service, and we are so glad that you can join us in this way. We are uh, excited to worship the Lord today. Uh, we are a church who loves God with all of our hearts, and we seek to grow in our faith and to serve the Lord through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, my name is Pastor Andrew, and I just want to say welcome to you as you come and join us this morning. We are going to sing um, a song called Hymn to the Holy Spirit kind of uh, illustrates the different ways the Holy Spirit uh, helps us in our faith journey. But before we do that, let's uh, do our memory verse from first, uh, Second Chronicles 7, 3b. That's chapter 7, verse 3b, second half. It goes like this. Yes, God is good. Yes, God's faithful love lasts forever. Amen. So let's sing together. If you would stand with us wherever you're at, um, or at least sing along with the words.
must be more than this. Oh, breath of God, come breathe with him. There must be more than Our scripture reading for today is 1 Kings 18, 25 through 29. The prophet Elijah makes fun of the prophets of Baal. They try to get Baal to light a sacrifice, praying for hours, but nothing happens. 1 Kings 18, 25 through 29. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of these bulls. Prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but don't add fire. So they took one of the bulls and that had been brought to them. They prepared it, and they called on Baal's name from morning to midday. They said, Great Baal, answer us. There was no sound or answer. They performed a hopping dance around the altar that had been set up. 
Around noon, Elijah started making fun of them. Shout louder. Certainly he's a god. Perhaps he's lost in thought or wandering or traveling somewhere. Or maybe he's asleep and you need West wake him up. So the prophets of Baal cried louder with voices and cut themselves with swords and knives as was their custom. Their blood flowed all over them. As noon passed, they went crazy with their ritual until it was time for the evening offering. Still, there was no sound or answer, no response whatsoever. Hello. What's this? <laughs> I don't know if you can read that. Dear Andrew, these are for you of God. I would think God would have nicer handwriting, but this must be some sort of prank or something. But I can't argue with presents. I love getting presents. Looks like they use some uh, Christmas wrapping or Christmas bags to uh, put these presents in. Let's see what we got, should we? Um, let's see. All right, let's start with this bag. We have butter, a stick of butter, okay. Uh, not my favorite thing, but uh, let's go with that. Here we have a box of a little container of baking powder, baking powder and butter. Uh, this one is oh, container, <laughs> that's sugar, a container full of sugar to go with our butter and our baking powder. I don't know, maybe you're seeing a theme here. Um, this one's kind of big. Uh, yep. All-purpose flour. So we have that. I think we have one left, right? This one's in a container. Let's pop that open. It looks like there's a napkin in here. Ooh, I gotta be careful. It is an egg. An egg, huh? So let me just take a look at what we got here. Let's see. What can I do? with these gifts. All right, so here I have all my gifts laid out. Flour, sugar, baking powder, butter, and an egg. Now, I know this sounds like I could make something with these things. I could make a cake or cookies or something like that, right? But there's something I'm missing. Right? If I have all of these ingredients and I mush them all together, I'm still just gonna get mush. What do I need in order for these things to turn into something delicious and glorious? I need fire, right? I need some heat. I need to put all these things, mix them together, and put them in an oven, and the heat of the oven will turn these ingredients and these gifts into something glorious. That's exactly what we're talking about today with burnt offerings. God has given each of us gifts, different abilities, different talents, and we need to mix those gifts together with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the heat and fire of the Holy Spirit. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, our gifts turn into something glorious. They turn into something that is useful and that brings joy to God and to others. And so that's what we want to think about today is what gifts has God given you? You probably aren't going to come into work and have a bunch of gift bags lined up full of ingredients, but God has given you certain gifts. So ask him, what gifts have you given me, God? What, what in my life am I good at or do I enjoy doing? What can your Holy Spirit use to make something glorious? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us gifts. Thank you for allowing us to use our gifts. Help us to use them with the power, with the heat, with the fire of your Holy Spirit to turn into something glorious. Amen.
strange fire, answered prayer. Second Chronicles 7, 1, 2, 3. As soon as Solomon finished praying the prayer to dedicate the new temple, fire came down from heaven and consumed the entirely burnt offering and the sacrifices, while the Lord's glory filled the temple. The priests were unable to enter the Lord's temple because the Lord's glory had filled the Lord's temple. All the Israelites were watching when the fire fell. The Lord's glory filled the temple, and they knelt down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, worshiping and giving the Lord thanks, saying, Yes, God is good. Yes, God's faithful love lasts forever. The story of Daniel versus the god Bel. Ever heard of it? Maybe not, because it's not in our Bibles. It's part of what we call the Deuterocanonical books, books written in between the New and the Old Testament times. They're, they're included in the Roman Catholic Bible, but as secondary authority. De Deutero meaning secondary. These writings include two chapters added to the book of Daniel. And one of them, Daniel 14, is the story of the contest between Daniel and the false god Bel. It begins in the court of the Persian king Cyrus. Cyrus is angry that Daniel refuses to worship the Bel's statue. Now the name Bel is actually a title, meaning Lord, and it was used to address the top god of the ancient Babylonians. Daniel, however, was a faithful prophet of the true God and refused to worship the false god and bowed down to the statue made of clay and bronze in the temple there. And once again, it got Daniel into trouble. Daniel tells the king that Bel is not a real god. King Cyrus, however, points to the massive amounts of food that they sacrificed to Bel each night, and the God consumes them, the food, by morning. The king brings in 70 priests of Bel to prove Daniel that Bel is real. And they tell the king to set a pile of food offerings in the temple and then lock up the temple and seal it. The next morning, the food is gone. Ah, Bel must be real. He eats this food every night. Then Daniel tells the king to look at the floor. For Daniel had scattered ashes on the floor around the food. And sure enough, there were footprints revealed in the ashes. The priests and their families had come in through a secret door and consumed the food that night. So Bel is proven to be a false god, and the temple and the priests are destroyed. This story is similar to a biblical story you might have heard of. It's also about a showdown in front of a king with a lone prophet of the true God in a contest against a host of prophets of a false god to reveal who is the one true God. The one key difference is that in the biblical story, God himself shows up in an all-consuming fire. The question I pose for us today is, what God are you praying to? You see, the stuff we face in our daily lives is real. Money doesn't stretch to the end of the month, job insecurity, the slow calcifying that comes from not being able to afford a different vehicle, or the trip this year, or that gaming system that your son really, really, really wants. Living in debt is real, isn't it? What God are you praying for to for your daily provision? Bill and Melinda Gates are getting divorced after 27 years. Makes you wonder about your marriage or that of those close to you. Can you make it? Do you want to? How about your kids heading off on their own? Will they make it? Their lives are fragile and so easily derailed by foolish choices. What God are you praying to for your marriage or for your family? Our church is hosting a second funeral this month. 
You know how it's like to lose someone in death, don't you? It's real. The diagnosis of cancer or a crippling disease, a dementia or heart failure, that's soberingly real, isn't it? What God are you praying to for your precarious life threatened on all sides? Now, we can handle a certain amount. We can take responsibility for some of our financial solvency, some of our relationship stability, some of our medical health. But when we lie awake at night, we know too well that much of the real stuff of life is beyond our control. It's bigger than we are. It's so overwhelming how true as we begin to get older and our fitness and abilities wane, we realize that we must trust in a God that is beyond ourselves, other than ourselves. Yes, other people may be around to help, but we cannot always rely on them. And so we turn to God. We call out. We hang on. We pray for a help that comes from outside of ourselves. We see the temples that we have built to the various gods who might help us. Gods of hard work. Gods of self-help and self-growth. Gods of rightly ordering our lives. Gods of living carefree and releasing responsibility. Gods of living for number one. Gods of escapism and denial. Gods of living in the moment and letting the rest go. What God are you praying to? The Temple to Bel promised help and security and healing, provided you fed it, gave it offerings and allegiance and commitment. How many mothers prayed for their children at that temple? How many times did men make promises before that statue, trusting for aid? The story of Daniel and Bell is terrifying because it reveals that the gods we often pray to, the gods we may trust in, the gods we may turn to for help in our hardest times, may really be a great Oz idol with little men scurrying away with the food or working the controls behind a curtain. That's the promise of self-help or putting number one first, actually, isn't it? It reveals that the only power available to help us is our own. It's down here what we can see. Then we lie awake at night, terrified, because the realities of our life are bigger than we are even when we are at our best and strongest. Even young men stumble and fall, grow weary. This is why we need a God who is an an all-consuming fire. We need to hear the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. The story of Daniel and Bel unmasks the God of human power. So we ask, is there hope in other gods? other powers, other forces? Are they reliable? Can we trust in them? Do they care about us and want our best interests? Hmm. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel introduced additional gods into the worship of the true God. They were the local gods, gods from before, Baal and his consort Asherah. You know, supplemental to their worship. No harm done, just a little extra. You know, the local gods of the area. And these gods let the people do more of what they wanted. They affirmed their thinking, allowed things more their way. Pretty attractive. Their worship grew in in popularity. The humility required by the true God was slowly supplanted by the self-gratification allowed by the other gods. And soon, that became most popular in their society. But remember, the rains didn't come down. As they worshipped in ways that seemed to let them have things the way they wanted, the rains of blessing and new life 
and thriving didn't come down. Water became scarce, as did hope. People struggled more and more to echo a living, to have abundant life, to even have life. And during the time of the drought, when the society was committed to the false gods, Elijah lays out a challenge. Turn to 1 Kings 18. We pick up the story here in verse 16. Then King Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, the one who troubles Israel? Notice how the prophet has been labeled as the troublemaker, the problem. Verse 18, Elijah answered, I haven't troubled Israel. You and your father's house have. You did as much when you deserted the Lord's commands and followed the Baals. Now, send a message and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel. Gather the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Ahab sent the message to all the Israelites. He gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you hobble back and forth between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow God. If Baal is God, follow Baal. The people gave no answer. Perhaps they were thinking how they would answer the question, Which God do you pray to? Verse 22. Elijah said to the people, I am the last of the Lord's prophets, but Baal's prophets number 450. Give us two bulls. Let Baal's prophets choose one. Let them cut it apart and set it on the wood, but don't add fire. I'll prepare the other bull. Put it on the wood, but won't add fire. Then all of you who, then all of you will call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers with fire, that's the real God. All the people answered, that's an excellent idea. Notice, whichever God answers, that's the real God. Well, in the passage you heard earlier, we see the, that the other prophets go first. They pray out loud over and over again, great, ba- great Baal, answer us. Verse 26. They prayed again and again for half the day. They performed dances and prayed louder, and they started doing bizarre rituals, cutting themselves, trying to conjure Baal's response. They tried all that they knew for hours and hours with all their earnestness to try to get Baal to do what they needed. But it says at the end in verse 29, still there was no sound or answer, no response whatsoever. Crickets. Now it's Elijah's turn. Verse 30. And Elijah said to the people, come here. All the people closed in. And he repaired the Lord's altar that had been damaged. Hmm. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord, Lord's word came, your name will be Israel. And he built the stones in, into an altar in the Lord's name. And he dug a trench around the big altar, enough to hold four gallons of dry grain. He put the wood in order, butchered the bull, and placed the bull on the wood. Fill four jars with water and pour it on the sacrifice and on the wood, he commanded. Do it a second time, he said. They did it a second time. Do it a third time. So they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and even the trench filled with water. All the time, at that time of evening, at the time of the evening offering, The prophet Elijah drew near and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. I have done all these things at your instructions. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, Lord, are the real God and that you can change their hearts. 
short, simple prayer. The Baal prophets prayed for a half a day. Verse 38. Then the Lord's fire fell. It consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. All the people saw this and fell on their faces. The Lord is the real God. The Lord is the real God, they exclaimed. And then, the rains came back. It's easy to start following the bells and the baals. It's convenient. It's popular. We get to live the way we want, to do what we want. And we're being religious. We are good people. Things seem to go well enough. But the drought comes. Life dries up. Hope shrivels. The car breaks down. Your kids go off to college. Your spouse of 27 years announces that we will no longer believe we can grow together as a couple in this next phase of our lives. Your doctor tells you that it's terminal. You rush to the gods that let you do what you wanted. Can they help? If they are bell, then you soon realize now that it's some form of trusting in human power, trusting in people. They can carry you a distance. But then they wear out. Yet your realities are eventually bigger than what people can fix, even at their best. If your gods are Baal, then you soon realize that they are not interested in your welfare. They were promising you what you wanted so that they would get what they wanted. But they would not, could not deliver what you need. At the crucial moment, when you need them most, they are terribly silent. Your role is to serve them. They use you. They enslave you. You serve them. But a simple and soft-spoken prayer reaches the ear of the one true God. The power of heaven is opened for you. And fire comes down. This is the one true God. This is the one who knows your need, who cares about you, who is listening to you, who has his eye on you. When you whisper a prayer, perhaps in fear, in doubt, perhaps in defeat, He hears and He answers. He comes to be who you need Him to be. He comes to give you what you need. He shows up to lift you. The true God God does not use you or fool you. He loves you and He helps you. He is the God of your provision the God of your protection, the God of your salvation. We see here a God who is an all-consuming fire. Notice how the flames burn the offering, the wood, the stones, the water, and even the ground. All-consuming. If God had just lit a small little fire on the altar, it would have been total victory. But that's not who God is. The lighting of that sacrifice is not about God getting a sacrifice that He wants. It's about lighting a sacrifice to demonstrate who is true, who is real, who is trustworthy, who we should call upon in our moment of need. It's a demonstration of power to build our confidence, to prove God's trustworthiness, to build our hope, to build our allegiance. And sure enough, all the people saw this and fell on their faces and they exclaimed, the Lord is the real God. The Lord is the real God. And then the rains came. Life returned. New beginnings started. Flowers bloomed in the desert and birds squawked and sang. New life returned to the land. And the people called upon the one true God. 
What God are you praying to? How long will you hobble back and forth between two opinions? Is it a God who offers you what you want, but is deaf to your need? Or is the Lord, or is the, Lord the one true God, who is not limited by human strength? He is not self-serving or, or silent to our need. He is an all-consuming fire. He is able to consume whatever power has its death grip on you. No, He will not give you whatever you want. He will not let you do all the things your way. No, He loves you too much for that. He will not always answer your prayers the way you choose or desire. But He does answer. And He answers in a way that gives you what you need to live, to flourish, to thrive, to grow. This is our God. God who answers with fire. That is the real God. He is the God of burnt offerings. The burnt offerings of our lives that mean nothing and are good for nothing. He takes them, consumes them, and returns to us life abundant and eternal. In real life, you need a real God. And the Lord, He is an all-consuming fire. What God are you praying to? Amen. So we're going to have our prayer time right now. And we're going to pray to the one true God. And for our prayer time, we're going to use some of our uh, use our prayer time to give God thanks for answered prayers. You have experienced answered prayers in your life. God has been faithful. He has proven himself to you. He has answered your prayers, given you what you need, sustained you to this moment. It hasn't been always the way you wanted, but you have been living abundantly. So as we pray, we're going to pray prayers of thanksgiving for answered prayers and trusting in God for what is ahead of us. Let's pray. Psalm 9.10 says, And those who know your name, O God, put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. O Lord, Faithful God, trustworthy God, reliable God, answering God. You have never forsaken those who seek you. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we spend time right now, God, lifting up to you, recalling and thanking you for the answered prayers of our lives. We take stock. We remember. You have helped us. Things have worked out. We have prayed for you desperately in times of financial shortages when money wasn't enough. And things worked out by your blessing. We have prayed for you in desperate times for relationships that have fallen apart, have turned south, have been hardened and petrified. And we remember now how you have softened those relationships, made them alive, renewed life again. We have laid before you special requests in times of need, jobs, unknown futures, unseen paths ahead, career choices, direction for life, not knowing what to do. We've come before you and asked you, Lord. And you have always, each and every time, faithfully taken us through, keeping us on the right path. We pray also, Lord, of thanksgivings for how you've answered prayers in the, in the loved ones around us. We have heard their testimonies. We have seen what you've done in their lives. We have watched them grow and flourish. 
our kids, our spouses, our, our family members, our loved ones, our neighbors. Lord, you have honored their requests, answered them, given them life. Thank you, God. We remember. We recall those miracles you've done. We pray for our church. We would notice all the ways you've brought about your amazing faithfulness, answering prayers, leading us through hardships, taking us through crazy twists and turns. And yet, each and every time, you have seen us through. We recall, Lord. We remember. Huh, we have seen you do some amazing things, God. We've had some good times with you. We pray for our community, our world. We have seen throughout history the ways that you have intervened and brought correction and brought help and brought us back from the brink of disaster. You know, how you have seen us through terrible tragedy and immense difficulties. Your Holy Spirit has sustained us, O oh God. You have answered our prayer time and time and time again. Not always the way we want, but the ways that have been brought, the ways that brought life. And so, God, remembering and recalling these answered prayers, we can turn to our future with confidence, putting our hope and trust not in ourselves, but in You. And so we can say and pray, as He says in Hebrews 10.23, let us hold tightly without wavering to the, to the hope that we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. We trust you, O oh God. We trust you. Amen. One of the ways that we trust in God is by committing our allegiance to Him. And God answers prayers through us. Prayers for others through us. We come to God and say, Lord, use me. And God says, I have a prayer request over here that needs to be answered. I'm going to ask you to go over here and address that need. You know how many times in your life God has answered your prayers with the help of someone else? God has raised up for you. So you can give of your time, your talents, your gifts, your service, your witness for God to answer prayers through you. Make yourself available this week ahead. You can give of your finances as well. You can do that through offerings to this church. <clears throat> you can give electronically, you can give online, you can give in here in person, putting monies in the gift boxes here at the worship center. You can also mail in your contributions, drop them off. Continue to align your resources for God to use so that He can answer prayers. Next week, our message is going to be on, for Pentecost, the big celebration next Sunday. We are, we, we are indoors next week as well. Two services. 8.30 and 10, Pentecost Sunday. Our theme will be the fire within. Our memory verse, one more time here before we close out. Let's try this together. Boldness here. Yes, God is good. Yes, God's faithful love lasts forever. Second Chronicles 7.3b. Receive this benediction. May the God who is faithful and trustworthy who has proven this most powerfully through sending Jesus, who faithfully and trustworthily came and gave of Himself so fully for our help. Give you now the Holy Spirit that you can live each day ahead now in confidence, relying upon your God's faithfulness because He is trustworthy. Amen. Go in peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy.